Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this edition of uh, this annual Business Ethics Week. And you know, when I was organizing it this year, I thought we've been doing this for quite a while and I just wanted to know how long this has been going on. And, and you know, unfortunately I haven't been very systematic, you know, so I should have said this is the seventh or eighth annual Business Ethics Week. And, and I think the first one was held in 2007. So it, this is a long kind of standing event in the college and over the years it has grown in kind of importance and, and, and one kind of fixed element of the, of the Business Ethics Week has always been Rich Mewson. You know, he's always been very involved in terms of where we went in terms of business ethics in the college and has always been you know, from day one supportive in terms of not only the importance of business ethics, but also that it should not be a fad. It should be something that companies value and that you as future business leaders value as well. So, you know, I'm delighted to see Rich back here again. He's always so kind. He's a very busy person, I know, but he's always so kind with his time and he actually comes to Whitewater and spends the whole day with us. And so I, you know, I won't take much more time, but I do want to talk a little bit about him. So he's chairman, president, and CEO of Badger Meter, which is based in Milwaukee and a Wisconsin-based company that is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Badger Meter's core competency is flow measurement solutions, and the company is a leading manufacturer and marketer of products incorporating liquid flow measurement and control technologies developed both internally and with other technology companies. And Badger Meter products are used in a wide variety of applications, including water, oil, and chemicals. So uh, Rich joined Badger Meter in 1995 as the VP of Finance and Chief Financial Officer. He was elected president and CEO in 2002 and chairman in 2004. And prior to that, he worked as Vice President of Finance and Treasurer of Zenith Sintered Products in Germantown, Wisconsin, and in the Audit Division of the Milwaukee Office of Arthur Anderson. He received a BBA in accounting from here, and then got an MBA from Kellogg uh, Northwestern, and he's a CPA. And in addition to these responsibilities at Badger Meter, uh, Rich also serves as director of Menasha Corporation, which is a consumer packaging company, and Serigraph, a specialty printing company. And, and the one thing I have to say uh, and I admire about Rich is his kind of, you know, his desire to give back to society, to co the community, to the university. So he's involved across many different things especially in Milwaukee, so he's, he has lots of volunteering activities and serves on the boards of many nonprofit organizations. So for example, he co-chairs the Milwaukee Water Council, which he also co-founded, and he serves on the board of Goodwill Industries of Southeastern Wisconsin. He's the chair there the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce and the United Performing Arts Fund. He was also appointed by the governor to the Great Lakes Protection Fund Board. He's a member of the Greater Milwaukee Committee and the Milwaukee Seven. And he also serves on the advisory board for the business school here and at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. So his past uh, nonprofit involvement includes the Milwaukee County, uh, County Council Boy Scouts of America for 25 years, Arthritis Foundation of Wisconsin, Milwaukee Repertory Theater, Wisconsin Manufacture and Commerce, and the YMCA. So he has received numerous awards, including the Biz Times 2000 Community Leader of the Year, the 2010 Business Leader of the Year from the Harvard Business School Club of Wisconsin, 2010 Communicator of the Year from the Public Relations Society of America and Wisconsin Chapter, the 2009 Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year for the Upper Midwest, and, and so many others. You know, I, I, I should at least leave some time for him to talk. So 
let's see the final thing if I can get this here so he lives uh, in Pewaukee with his wife Mary Beth and they have two grown children uh, Matt and Julie and I believe they both graduated from here right so please help me and uh, in welcoming uh, Rich Musen thank you thank you Good afternoon. <coughs> so as Praveen said, I'm Rich Musen ba with Badger Meter. Uh, just to give you a little background, Badger Meter is a publicly traded company. We are the largest maker of water meters in North America. It's about two thirds of our business. The other third of our business is making flow meters for all around the world. We make the uh, small meters that go in a Predator drone aircraft to balance the fuel between the wings. It's a very expensive meter. We make the meter that goes in your Keurig coffee maker to tell it when to stop pouring coffee so your cup doesn't overflow. And, uh, and if your Keurig doesn't work, it's not because of my meter. They have a scaling problem in there. Try putting some vinegar through it. Um, so th that isn't my problem. Uh, I have 1,500 employees around the world, eight plants in five countries, so I travel around the world a lot. And I do get involved in ethical issues a lot. Um, at Badger Meter, we hold ourselves to a very high ethical standard, and when an ethical issue comes up, I insist it comes to me. And I insist that if anybody's gonna make a question about a gray area, that should be me, because I'm the one ultimately gonna be held responsible for it, so I wanna make sure I'm involved. I also spend a lot of time talking ethics. One of the things I do is I meet with every new employee at Badger Meter. Now, it's 1,500 employees, and they're in, eight different, they're in five different countries at eight locations, so I travel around the world, and when I get there, any new employees that have been hired since I was last there, I sit down and I meet with them. One of the things I talk about is ethics. And because I, I work very hard to maintain one ethical view at Badger Meter, which I feel is very important. And what I'm gonna do is talk about ethics in two pieces. I'm gonna talk about it in a very personal level, and then I'm gonna talk, bring it up to a corporate level. So I'm gonna talk about your ethics, and then I'm gonna talk about corporations' ethics. And I'm gonna leave time for questions, and I really do wanna hear your questions. But let's start with personal ethics. Mae West, uh, the great actress who you, none of you know, um, once said that uh, there are two types of people in the world, there are the goods and the bads. And the trick is not to get caught with the goods. And uh, it's a little Mae West-ism. Mae West is also the woman who said, she was you know, the first woman to be banned from the radio waves for provocative statements uh, back in the, radio, in the time of radio. Uh, she was banned for 13 years. She was the woman who said, when I'm good, I'm very good, and when I'm bad, I'm even better. Um, so that was Mae West. She was just a classic. Um, but Mae West, uh, but uh, Mae West aside, in my opinion, you really have three groups of people. You have the very good, you have the very bad, and then you have everybody else in between. And the very good are people I don't want to associate with because they're absolutely no fun, okay? They're ridiculously good. I could never hold myself to their standard. I don't even want to try. And the very bad are the sociopaths in society that I don't even want to deal with, okay? I don't want to stay away from them. The rest of them are us. We are the great unwashed mass. We are the people in the middle. We are the, we are the common people. And the fact of the matter is, I'm sure every one of you considers yourself ethical, right? Is it fair to say? But in reality, you all lie, cheat, and steal on a regular basis. You all do. We all do. Okay? And so as much as you think of yourself as ethical, if you really examine your behavior, you'll find out that there's a lot of gray areas in your life. Now, we all lie. We're taught to lie from an early age. When you open up your Christmas present and Grandma gave you a pair of knitted socks, and, you, and your mother says, call grandma and tell her how much you love the socks. You say, but mom, I don't like the socks. She says, you get on the phone with that gray-haired old lady and lie to her and tell her you love the socks, right? And we all did it. We all lied to grandma. We learned at a very early age that you are supposed to lie, that we are expected to lie in society, okay? There are certain things we lie about. Now, men are very good liars, all right? Uh, and we come by it naturally. We're better liars than women. Um, and most women realize that. What you don't realize is men are good liars because of women. It's your fault. You made us good liars. All right? If there were ever any honest men, they died out long ago. They died out. Because every married man, at some point in his marriage, was asked the question by his wife, does my butt look big in this dress? And those who answered honestly did not get to reproduce that night. But those who lied 
Those who lied got to reproduce. This goes back to, my, does my butt look big in the stoga, okay? This goes back to Roman times. The liars got to reproduce. The honest men, their, their, their genetic material was culled from the gene pool by you women. You decided you didn't want to have anything to do with honest men. You preferred liars. So men, we are all great liars. But we come by it honestly. We come by it naturally. We are all descended from a great line of liars who would have never gotten lucky if they hadn't lied. So we know that we have to do this. So understand that everybody in society lies. We lie all the time. You also cheat, OK? You probably all cheated today at one time or another. You cheat because the law says you're supposed to drive 55 miles an hour, and you drive 60, 65, right? We all do it. I don't know of anybody who has never exceeded the speed limit. Yet you are, you are violating the law. You're exceeding the speed limit. Am I right? Why, why would you drive 60 in a 55? Have you ever driven, you drive? Have you ever driven 60 in a 55? Oh yeah? Why? Because everybody else was doing it. Okay? So basically, your ethical theory on life is that as long as everybody else does it, I can do it. Not with everything. Okay, so only certain things. Why this one? You have no idea. Is it possibly because you know that the cops won't pull you over at 60 and a 55? So in other words, even though the law says the speed limit is 55, society says we don't really mean it. And that's true. That's exactly what it is. Society has determined, and the police went around along with it, that 60 and a 55 is okay. So 55 is really more of a suggestion. Now, why don't you drive 90 and a 55? You'll get pulled over, exactly. So, so we all violate the law in one way or another. You all steal a little bit. We all steal on a regular basis. How many of you have a, a credit card? Well, you probably have debit cards knowing you guys, but some of you might have credit cards, okay? When you take out that credit card, you usually sign a contract that says you will pay your credit card bill by the first of the month, right? And in reality, you know that if you pay it by the 10th, you're, it's going to be okay. They're not going to say anything, right? So you pay it by the 10th. Now, technically, you're stealing a little bit of money. If, if you're business students, you've learned about the time value of money. So you've, ste you've stolen a little bit of interest from the, uh, from the lending company, right? By paying them a little bit late. You have a mortgage. You pay it 10 days late. Everybody pays it 10 days late. They know they can get away with it. In fact, the average terms in the business world is net 30. When we sell something, we expect to be paid in 30 days. The average accounts receivable in the business world is 48 days. So even though we expect in 30, we get paid in 48. Everybody does. Everybody's cheating us just a little bit. So before you feel too good about yourselves that, hey, I'm really an ethical person. I don't even need to come to this seminar on ethics. I do everything right already. The fact of the matter is, you're not the very goods. Fortunately, you're not the very bads. You're like me. You're one of us. You're one of the great unwashed masses. You're the in-between. You're the ones, we're all the ones who say, we try to be good, okay? And we try not to be real bad. But in reality, we're walking this fine line in between all the time. And, and so, so you, you, you try to live your life in a way that you believe is ethical. But when you put it under a, mag, mag, a, micro, a microscope, people could say, hmm, there's some things you do that aren't quite ethical. There's some things you do that aren't quite right when you really examine it. So let me put an ethical quandary to you. Because when you think about business ethics, you think, all right, I would never do what Bernie Madoff did. I would not embezzle money. I would not steal from my clients. You know what? I will never falsify a financial report. I will never cheat. You might cheat on your taxes a little bit. You might claim that you gave some money to charity that you didn't give to charity or something like that. But you'll never cheat big is what you're really saying, OK? So that's what you say. But the truth of the matter is, in your career, in your business careers, you're not going to run into those ethical issues. Very few people in this room are ever going to have billions of dollars invested under investment that you're managing that you will have an opportunity to embezzle like Bernie Madoff did or many of the other people who, have, who, have, who are now sitting in jail. You just won't be there. You're going to be faced with little ethical issues, with little ethical quandaries. 
And the, the real key is going to be how you handle those. Because it is a slippery slope. You start out down that slippery slope, and before you know it, you're in a lot deeper than you, than you meant to be. Okay? Um, i got to find a, a, a couple people here. Are you two friends? Okay, perfect. All right? Let's say you go to work for Badger Meter. Okay? And it's your first month at Badger Meter, and you're working side by side at, at, at two desks. Okay? And, and I'm sorry, what's your name? Jenna. Jenna? Sarah. Sarah. Okay, Jenna. Jenna, Sarah. So, Sarah, Jenna says to you, um, it's 4 o'clock, okay? I got tickets to the Brewer game tonight. I want to tailgate, okay? I'm supposed to work till 5, but I'm going to go to the Brewer game. If the boss comes by, you tell him that I'm down on the shipping dock, okay? And she leaves. You got the picture now? All right. So now I come by and I say, Sarah, where's Jenna? What's your answer? What's your answer? She left. You mean she left, you know where she went? She's not in the building. She's nowhere in the building. So are you saying she left early? Boy, you just threw your friend under the bus. You're really friends or was that? No, you're really friends? And she threw you under the bus like that? Wow. Just like that, you threw her under the bus. So now the next day when she's fired, you're, you're okay with that? She should have known better. Okay, so you throw her under the bus. Just out of curiosity, assuming this other person is a very good friend of yours, how many of you would rat him out? I'm just curious. How many of you wouldn't, wouldn't rat him out? Okay. So most wouldn't rat them out. That's interesting. Does anybody want to give me an answer that you might give the boss? I'm always interested in the kind of answers. Anybody want to take a shot at this? Nobody wants a piece of this? Yeah. She had to leave early. That's your answer. She had to leave early. That puts it back in her court tomorrow when I come. And then you got a chance to warn, you, warn her that I, the boss came by, I told the boss you had to leave early, you better come up with a damn good story, right? So you kind of, you haven't thrown her all the way under the bus, you've just laid her in the road and kind of edged her towards the bus, is what you've done. Okay, I got it. Anybody else want to take a shot at this? Yeah. You would say you don't know where she is. Okay, no, no, you, you would say, and, 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 and that's a good one, so you would lie. You would basically lie, because you do know where she is. She told you where she was going. She's at, in fact, she's at the brewer game right now, drinking beer, eating brats. She's having a great time while you're working. But you would lie to your boss and say you don't know where she is. That's interesting. Anybody else want? Yeah? So, Praveen, you've been running these ethics programs since 2007. Do you feel like you should just go home and crawl into a hole and give up? <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. No kidding. We have not made much progress here, have we? Okay. So you, so you got no problem at all creating an elaborate lie. Okay, an elaborate lie. What I love is I, I, I get what I often call the Catholic answer, and, and I'm not a religious person. I just use these generically as terms. The Catholic answer is, well, I would lie, but it would be wrong. Okay, because the Catholics believe you can do something wrong, you go to confession, you confess it, and you're clean, and everything's okay, and you can lie again next week. So that's the Catholic answer. The Lutheran answer, what, what I call the Lutheran answer, or the Protestant answer, is, um, well... I didn't technically lie, okay? I would say to the boss, well, she's not here right now. Can I take a message? Um, you know, she, she said she was going down to the shipping dock, okay? Uh, or she said I should tell you she's going down to the shipping dock. That, that, that's, so technically, I didn't lie. Technically, I knew where she was, but I misled the boss, so that's okay. So that's kind of the Protestant answer and the Catholic answer is what I, what I call them. Um, it's interesting because... To me, you know what the answer is? To me, the answer is so obvious. The answer is so obvious. 
The answer, Sarah, is not the, the answer you gave when the boss asked. The solution to your problem is you should have never been in this situation. When she turned to you and said, I'm going to the brewer game. If the boss come by, comes by, tell him I'm on the shipping dock. You should have said to her, hold it. No, do not put me in that situation, okay? If you want to walk away from your desk, I don't want to know where you're going. Don't even tell me. Whether you're going to the shipping dock or the brewer game, I don't want to know. If the boss comes by, then I can honestly say I don't want to know. But do not put me in a situation where I have to lie to my boss. That would be the right answer. My point is that the ethical conundrums that are going to creep up on you guys are going to creep up on you because you don't see them coming and head them off. You need to see them coming and head them off. And you, you more than any other generation in history, are going to have big, serious problems. And the reason you're going to have big, serious problems is because, we, because you guys, at your age, are in a world where your circle of friends are closer to you than any circle of friends ever have been in the past. Because you're able to remain connected all the time, you're able to, remain, to communicate all the time, you guys form, the sociologist tells us, you guys form closer bonded friendships at an earlier age than any people in history. And so it's those friendships that are going to get you in a hell of a lot of hot water if you're not careful with them. That's what you have to watch for. That's the real key. So let me go down another path here. The next path I'd like to go down is, um, is the idea, of, is the idea of, of what you're allowed to do. Okay? For example, I had an employee, a sales manager, who uh, was out of town. And this employee, uh, decide, it was his hometown. It was where he was from. It was, in fact, it was Bastrop, Louisiana. I remember the name of it. This was probably about 10 years ago. And this guy was in Bastrop, Louisiana, and he was making sales calls. We had sent him there. But it was the town he grew up in. So he, he decided to stay at his parents' house and saved us the cost of a hotel. Pretty decent. Nice guy. Um, and then, as a thank you at the end of the week, for he thought it would be appropriate to take his parents out for a nice steak dinner. The nice steak dinner was a heck of a lot less expensive than the cost of a hotel for a week, so he felt that was appropriate. Are you with me so far? No problem with this so far? Right. Then on his expense report, he thought, well, somebody might question if I say I took my parents out for a steak dinner, so I'm going to say it was the client I took out for the steak dinner. So he put down the client's name as the person he was entertaining for the steak dinner. Now, how do you feel about this? Is he okay? He saved the company money. Anybody? Everybody's okay with this. You're not okay. Why not? Because he... If it was okay, why did he have to lie? If this was an acceptable business decision, why did he feel he had to lie? Why did he have to cover it up with a lie? We ended up firing him, by the way. Okay? Why, why was it necessary to lie about this? In fact, had he called his boss and said, look, I'm going to stay at my parents' house for the week, save the company the cost of a hotel, and I'd like to take my parents out for a nice hotel, his boss admitted I would have said yes. It made perfect sense. Why did you have to falsify an expense report? to cover this up. And th this brings me to a very important thing that you need to learn. We have books, there are books written on business ethics, okay? And pages and pages of ethics. And you can read all through them. Praveen, I think you wrote a book, didn't you? All right, wonderful books, all right? It's all, your book is, okay, I'm sorry. But, but it is because in my opinion, and the entire book could have contained one three-letter word on every page. The same three-letter word on every page. I'm going to print a business ethics book, and it's going to be 500 pages with the same three-letter three word in big, bold letters on every page. You flip through it, it's going to be one big, one, one word. And you know what that word is? Does anybody want to take a shot at what that word is? It's not God. Okay. Anybody want to take a shot at it? My three-letter, you, okay. Ask, thank you. Did, didn't you come to one of my speeches before? Okay, thank you. The three-letter word is ask. If he had asked his boss, he would have been clean. And you know what? Here's the beauty of it. If I disagreed with his boss, if he asked his boss, can I take my parents to dinner and bill it to the company 
And his boss said yes, and he took his parents to dinner, and he built the company. And I found out about it, and I'm a, ja I'm a jerk, and I don't think he should have done that, and I'm angry. Can I be angry at him? No, I should be angry at his boss. And now, this isn't an ethical issue anymore. This is purely a business judgment issue. Because the boss who approved it did not get any benefit from it. It's an ethical issue when you personally benefit from it. That boss didn't benefit. Now, I can be angry at that boss for making what I believe was a bad business judgment. By the way, I wouldn't be. I think it's a good business judgment. I could be angry at that boss. But it's no longer an ethical issue. Once you ask, it's not an ethical issue. Is it OK to copy your tax return on the company uh, photocopier? I asked this in one of my ethics meetings at Badger Meter. And everybody just stared at me. And I said, all right, how many of you have ever copied your tax return on the company photocopier? Nobody raised their hand. And I said, oh, I'll make it easy. I'll start. And all the hands went up, OK? They all do it. But if you're not, because it's ridiculous to me that I should have a salaried employee leave work early to go to a Kinko's and make a photocopy when they're sitting next to a photocopier. Now, on the other hand, if you're running a tax business at night and you're copying 50 of them, I got a problem with that, right? But the answer, if you go to work, Next April, you're working for a company. There's a photocopier right next to you. You've got your tax return. You want to know whether or not it's okay to copy it. What do you do? Come in after hours when nobody's around and make the copy and hope the damn thing doesn't jam with your 1040 stuck in there so that when the, everybody comes by, they go, what's this? They pull out a piece of your 1040, okay? Because believe me, it will jam when you try to put something personal in there. They always do because they know that it's something personal. Instead of doing that, Simply ask, hey, can I copy my tax return on the company photocopier? If they say no, fine. If they say yes, it's not a problem. It's no longer an ethical issue. Ask. All you have to do is ask. And I am shocked at how many people I hire who don't seem to understand that. To understand the power of simply asking, is it OK for me to do this? So let's take it from a personal level, now that I've called you all thieves and liars, OK? Let's take it from a personal level, and let's move it up to a corporate level. And, le and let me talk about Badger Meter. Badger me at Badger Meter, we hold ourselves to an extremely high ethical standard. And in fact, every new employee, I sit down personally with them, and I meet with them for a half an hour, and I talk about ethics. And I talk about the importance of ethics at Badger Meter. And one of the best questions I ever got in speaking to students like this was a woman here at Whitewater. This was about 10 years ago, asked me. She said, you know, you're told when you go to work for a company that you should find out what their culture is. That that's very important to know whether or not you will be a fit into their culture. And, and I said, yes, that's absolutely true. Because we hire everybody based on their education and their experience. And we fire everybody based on chemistry, that they just didn't fit in. That's the number one reason people get fired, is, is that they're just not fitting into our culture. And I said, that's absolutely true. And she said, how do you figure out what a company's culture is? Because if you read those glossy annual reports I handed out, or if you go to the website, or you listen to the speeches by the CEO, these people all sound the same. They all read the same. They all talk about how ethical they are. And they all talk about how green they are and sustainable. And all of these companies sound the same. What the heck is the difference? She says, how do you really figure out what a company's culture is? And I said to her, actually, that's relatively easy. You need to find out what people get fired for. That's what determines a company's culture. Ultimately, if you find out what people get fired for, that's the culture of the company. I worked 12 years at Arthur Anderson. Number one reason people got fired is because they wouldn't work 60 or 70 hours a week during busy season. The culture in this company was, and they even had a saying for it, they said, we work hard, we play hard. This was a very hard working company, and you were expected to put in those hours. If you didn't put in those hours, you were gone. Don't go to work for a company that expects you to work 60, 70 hours and not work there. My brother-in-law went to work for Kohl's. And when he interviewed, they said to him, Doug, we're going to make you an offer. Uh, it was a, a fairly high-level IT position. It was an IT manager position. And they said, but in the interview, we didn't ask, but you offered that you have a wife and some children at home. And you need to know that here at Kohl's, our president works every Saturday. Therefore, our VPs work every Saturday. Therefore, our managers work every Saturday. And basically, here at Kohl's, if you aren't working 50 to 60 hours a week, every week, all year round, you're not doing your job. Now, Doug took the job. They said, we want you to go home, talk to your wife, think about it, let us know 
tomorrow whether or not you want the job. He took the job. And Doug works 50 or 60 hours a week. I respect Coles for putting that up front. Coles put it right up front and said to them, this is our culture. And if you're not going to fit in the culture, don't take the job. Because we don't want to waste time training you and then find out that you expect to be going home after 40 hours. That you play softball every Saturday morning. That you, that you want to be going to your children's recital. Okay? you got to understand, we're expecting these hours. And you know what? When, when Thanksgiving comes along and we have Black Friday, you're going to be working 24 hours straight for a few days to keep our stores running. This is the expectation of Kohl's. I respect them for putting that up front. So they told you right off the bat. Ultimately, find out what people get fired for. Now, you don't ever want to go into a job interview and ask the question, so what do people get fired for around here? See, just not a good question to ask in a job interview. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that little bit, bit of advice. I did have a woman who was applying for a VP of HR role who asked me the question, but it didn't sound like she was asking the question. It took me a moment to realize it. She said to me, so, she said, Rich, you, let's say you hire me into this role. Six, nine, 12 months from now, how will you know whether or not you made a good decision? Her real question was, what do people get fired for around here? That's what she was asking, in a very clever way. HR people are very clever. They do enough interviewing. They know this stuff. So at Badger Meter, Badger Meter has a high ethical culture. We hold ourselves to a very high ethical standard. And the easiest way to get fired at Badger Meter is to violate ethics. In fact, I have eight vice presidents around the world. Um, I fired one of them for violating ethics. Simple as that. He violated ethics and, and, and didn't, didn't even bat an eye about it, and I fired him. And, it, and I, in fact, I'll tell you the whole story so you understand what it was. Because this was a person making about $200,000 a year that I fired. Um, he had a customer ask him, the customer said, hey, I'm selling my business to another guy. So what I'd like to do is on Friday of this week, return all of my inventory to you for credit, and on Monday you ship it all back to the business and rebill us. And he said, yeah, I think we could do that. And he sent the paperwork over to accounting. My controller, okay, who is uh, the scariest woman at Badger Meter, we all really work for her, uh, you don't want to get on her bad side if she lets her flying monkeys out after you. Um, she, she immediately said, this is a scam transaction. I know what's happening here. This guy is selling his business for a fixed price, with or without inventory. He's returning all the inventory to us. He's going to get a million dollar credit to his bank account. On Monday, the new owner is going to walk in. All the inventory is going to arrive, and he's going to have to write a check for a million dollars to us. He's screwing the, the, he's screwing the new owner. So she rejected it. And the vice president overruled her and did it anyway. And so the shit hit the fan, because it got up to me. And I said to him, what were you thinking? And he said, I was doing a good service for our customer. I said, you were doing a service for our former customer. You were screwing our new customer. And you knew it was a sham transaction. And this guy had been shady on me for a few times. He, he was walking the line one time too many. I fired him. So you want to find out what a company's culture is, find out pe what people get fired for. If they're willing to fire a vice president over ethics, you have a company with a high ethical standard. And that's what Badger Meter has. Now, why is Badger Meter an ethical company? It's been an ethical company for 108 years. We hold ourselves to a higher ethical standard than our competitors. We hold ourselves to a higher ethical standard than other companies. Why do we do that? Our purchasing people can't accept a cup of coffee. A very common scam in purchasing is buy my crappy toner cartridges and I'll give you three overpriced toner cartridges and I'll give you three tickets to a Packer game or something like that. These companies are doing this all the time. Purchasing people can make out really well if they're unethical. We're very strict with our purchasing people. We're very strict with our salespeople that they don't overpromise. Why would Badger Meter be such an ethical company? Is it because I'm an ethical person? <laughs> I'd sell my mother to the gypsies if I could get the right price for her, okay? There's nothing ethical about me, all right? It, it's that I happen to work for a company that says ethics is important. So now, yes, I'm an ethical person. Why? I want to keep my job. I'm working for an ethical company. If I was working for the mafia, I'd have a whole different set of eth ethics. But the fact of the matter is, a company's culture is often defined by its customer base. 108 years ago, our company was founded to sell water meters. Who buys water meters? Who buys water meters? Somebody said something over here. What? No, when you build a house, you don't buy a water meter. You don't get to go and buy wa any water meter you want and stick it in the basement. In fact, you don't even own the water meter in your house. Who owns your water meter? 
The water department, the water utility, yes. The water utility buys the water meter. They own the water meter that's in your house. Water utilities are departments of what? Of municipalities, of cities. Water utilities are governmental entities. If somebody at Kohl's Corporation takes a bribe, takes a bribe for buying crappy clothes, okay, and Kohl's finds out about it, that person will probably get fired. If a Kohl's salesperson pays a bribe, that salesperson will probably get fired. In my world, you bribe a government official, you go to jail, it's a felony. You go to prison. So 108 years ago, the founders of Badger Meter said, we're gonna build our entire business on selling things to government officials. We have to be cleaner than clean. We have to be, there used to be a saying, cleaner than Caesar's wife, but we found out that some of the Caesar's wives weren't that clean. Um, but, but for those of you who are, who, who are history majors, um, and my, my nephew told me, my nephew goes here, he said he wanted to be a history major. I said, that's great, because they're gonna be opening a big history factory down the street, they'll be hiring any day now, I'm sure you'll find a job. And, uh, and it's not that I don't like history majors. I do like history majors, I always tip them 20%. They're, they're great people. Thank God we've got history majors in the world, or else our soup would be cold whenever we get it. Um, but I'm sorry, I digress. But, but our founders 108 years ago said Badger Meter must have a brand. A brand that everybody says if you do business with Badger Meter, nothing underhanded will happen. Nothing happens to the table. All it would take is one blemish on that brand and my business would go down. People love to ask me the question. On Friday, I'll have my annual shareholders meeting. I guarantee you I will get the question because I get it every year. Some shareholder will say, Rich, what keeps you awake at night? And my answer is my wife flopping around like a tuna on a trawler deck. But second to that, what really keeps me, <laughs> she loves that analogy, what really keeps me awake at night is the idea that somebody would damage our brand. Badger Meter's brand, it took us 108 years to build it. We have a reputation in the marketplace as being the ethical company. Every city official, every mayor in the United States, every water utility manager knows that nobody will ever question them buying something from Badger Meter. Question that something underhanded happened because Badger Meter has such a great brand. So when you're in that industry, ethics becomes extremely important. You have to be extremely ethical. And that's why we hold ourselves to such, to a, such a high ethical standard. That's what's important. Now, I'm gonna ask you another question. Okay, I like to use the Socratic method here. Okay, my, my next question is, what is the purpose of business? Why do for-profit businesses exist? You're business students, aren't you? I would hope by now you might have learned this. Yes. To make money, okay? Any other reason? Any other reason? That's it? Yeah. To provide goods and services to the consumer? That's what you're gonna say? Anything else? Anyone else wanna take a shot at this? Better answer than I usually get. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. For-profit businesses exist to make money for their shareholders. I wouldn't even say, I wouldn't even agree that they exist to provide goods and services to the customers. Because I will, I will close down a business that isn't making money. Now, if I exist to provide goods and services, closing down a business doesn't make any sense. But I'll close down that business if it means more money for my shareholders. My job is to make money for the shareholders. If you don't believe that for-profit businesses exist to make money for their shareholders, please go to work for a nonprofit or go to work for the government. You'll be much happier, I'll be much happier, okay? For-profit businesses exist to make money for their shareholders, that's it. And you know, I love to tell the story because there, there are people who, and, and this school is much better than some of the schools I talk to, because some of the schools I talk to, you get four years of socialist teaching, okay? I'm surprised they don't have Karl Marx on staff teaching you, all right? It tends to lean very left, all right? Me, I'm so right I can't drive in England, okay? I, I, I lean far right, all right? If you haven't figured this out, I'm a Republican, all right? Um, and what I get at some schools is, well, businesses exist to create jobs. Businesses exist for the good of mankind. Businesses exist for the good of, 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 the, of the overall community. And what I love to say to them is, okay, let's take an example. Let's say your father uh, 
runs a restaurant. He spent his entire life building this restaurant. It's a good restaurant. It's making good money. In fact, the restaurant makes enough money that your father, now at age 65, can go and retire to Florida. The restaurant will pay him, makes enough money that he can hire a general manager, pay that general manager $60,000 a year, and still have another $50,000 a year left over to supplement his income in Florida. Pretty damn good. That's what he's built in his lifetime. So he hires one of you, a graduate right out of business school from Whitewater. And he says, I want you to come in, I'll pay you 50 grand a year to run my restaurant for me. And you say, you know what? I have just earned my degree from UW-Whitewater. I know everything there is to know about business. I will run your restaurant for you. He says, great. And he takes off and goes to Florida. He comes back a year later and he says, I'm here to collect my $50,000. And your answer is, there's no $50,000. He says, why not? Well, the first thing I did after you left is I lowered the prices. And you know what? The customers love us. They voted us the number one restaurant in the city. They are so happy with the lower prices, they absolutely love it. And by the way, I gave all the employees a 20% raise. You are the most popular employer in the city. This restaurant is the number one employer in the city because I gave all the employees a 20% raise. And then I took whatever money was left over and I gave it to the city for a new park, a park named after you. You should be so happy. Okay, because businesses don't exist to make, in my opinion, what I learned in business school is businesses don't exist to make money for their owners. Businesses exist to create jobs, to serve customers, to, to serve the community. These other constituents love you. And you know, your father, the, you know what the old man does? He fires you and he comes out of retirement and he has to go back and start running his business again because you screwed it up. That's what happens when a socialist runs a business who believes that businesses don't exist to make money. Businesses exist to make money. That's the number one thing you need to understand. But now I'm going to give you the second part of that, which is so important for you to understand. Businesses exist to make money, dot, dot, dot. And what comes after the dots is on a long-term sustainable business, on a long-term sustainable basis. Businesses exist to make money for their shareholders on a long-term sustainable basis. I could make a hell of a lot of money this year by being unethical. I could make a hell of a lot of money this year by screwing over my employees. I could make a hell of a lot of money by screwing over my customers. And I could make a hell of a lot of money by screwing over my community. And instead of disposing of my hazardous waste, just dump it in the river behind my plant. I could do all of that and I could make a hell of a lot of money this year. And what would happen to me next year? I got angry employees who are quitting. I got customers who are dropping me, right? I got the city suing me. I got the EPA on my butt. I got all kinds of problems. The answer is businesses exist to make money for their shareholders on a long-term sustainable basis. And you cannot make money for your shareholders on a long-term sustainable basis operating your business unethically. You have to take care of your customers, your, 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 not only your shareholders, but your customers, your suppliers, your employees, the community in which you work. You must take care of those and balance all of this. And if it wasn't a balancing act, we wouldn't need managers. If there was no balancing act, you guys wouldn't even be in school because I don't need you to learn, okay? If all I had to worry about is, is screwing everybody and making money, I don't need educated people. I, you know, one of the managers once said to me, my job is so hard because you give me conflicting objectives. And I go, of course I give you conflicting objectives. That's why you're a manager. If there are no conflicting objectives, I don't need a manager. An accounts payable clerk sits and processes accounts payable. There is no conflicting objective there. Your job is to come in and process the accounts payable. I don't need a manager to process accounts payable, right? On the other hand, I say to my salespeople, I need you to go out and figure out where to price our product and price it as high as you possibly can but not so high that the customer won't buy it. It's what I call, I want you to pr price it where the customer says, ouch, but yes. That's the price I want. And they go, well, those are two conflicting objectives. I don't know how high to go or how low to go. I go, that's your job to figure it out. That's why I hire managers. You're supposed to figure this out. I tell my shop floor, I want you to get me the highest possible quality, the best possible throughput, at the lowest possible cost. And they go, but those are all conflicting. To get more quality, I gotta spend more money. To get lower costs, I gotta lower quality. That's right, they're all conflicting. That's why you go to business school. 
That's why you learn about all this stuff, and that's why we hire managers and pay them a lot of money, so that you can balance conflicting objectives. When I look at my entire business, I got conflicting objectives. I want my employees happy, but if I pay them too much, I don't have money for my shareholders. I want my customers to love us, but if I lower prices too far, I don't have money for the shareholders. I want my suppliers to want to sell me product, but if I screw them too bad on the terms, they won't want to sell to me. So we're constantly balancing these objectives. That's what makes business so challenging. And to do it in an ethical way, where you're figuring out how to treat everybody fairly, that's really the key. That's, that, that's, that's the whole key to business, is balancing all of this out. That makes sense? Right. Making a good point here? I don't know. Just nod. Okay. All right, I want to open this up to questions, because I want to leave time for you guys to ask questions. Anything is fair game. Um, if you don't have questions, I'll suggest a few, but go ahead. Does, any, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, they have a microphone here. Why don't you come down? They want, they want you to speak into the microphone because they love the lilting sound of your voice and uh, not the rasping sound of mine. So this is like a, uh, an Obama town hall, <laughs> except I don't lie. <laughs> Can you hear me? Go ahead. All right. Well, you were talking about ethics and how you do, you have to deal with the government in here. How do you deal with governments abroad? I mean, having high ethics, but then it depends on the standards in each country. How do you deal with that? You're right. Her, her question is about ethics abroad, which, which is trickier. For example, Mexico. Mexico is a difficult country to deal, to deal in. There is a lot of corruption in Mexico. Badger Meter has about a 32% share in the United States. In Mexico, I have about a 7% share. Why do I have a 7% share in Mexico when I have a 32% share in the United States? Because I won't pay bribes. Now, I've had people say to me, um, well, Rich, we sell just fine in Mexico and we don't pay bribes. What they do is they hire middlemen. They sell to a distributor who then pays the bribes and sells for them. I won't even do that. Again, I have to be cleaner than clean. I don't even want to have a distributor that might have a black mark on them. So I have to stay away from that. But in Mexico, it is common. It is common business practice. In fact, <laughs> years ago when, we put, when the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act came out in the United States, which basically said you, you can't pay bribes anymore, um, and, and uh, I, my predecessor called over to our German manager and said, you know, you have to follow these foreign corrupt practices. And he goes, this is not a problem in Germany. He said, we never bribe government officials in Germany. And my predecessor said, oh, thank God, that's good. And he said, well, do you bribe non-government officials? He says, all the time, all the time. But we don't bribe government officials. In Germany, it's legal to bribe non-government officials. It's illegal to bribe government officials. And we were like, no, we don't pay any bribes ever, period. So there were, it was a struggle with a lot of these countries in dealing with their culture. Badger Meter made the decision that the U.S. ethics rules, it, it, I'm sorry, it was either going to be the U.S. ethics rules or the foreign ethics rules, whichever was stricter. Now, generally, we find few that are stricter. London's got a, a few aspects that are, or England has a few aspects that are a little bit stricter. But generally, you don't. Gen generally, the U.S. rules are the most strict. So that's our policy. We will always go with whichever is the stricter. And it does cost us business opportunities. In fact, I love CEOs who get up and say, I run an ethical company. And I say to them, well, what do you mean an ethical company? What do you mean by that? And they say, well, we always follow the law. And I say, well, if you're letting lawyers tell you what's right or wrong, you're making a huge mistake. The law is not designed to tell us what's right or wrong. The law is simply designed to make society work. The, the, the law has nothing to do with right or wrong. Driving 55 or 60 has nothing to do with, what, what's, with what's right or wrong. It just has to do with we don't want you going so fast that you're going to kill somebody. So our laws were not designed to tell us what is ethical or unethical. And I spent years looking into this. I, I mean, I spent a lot of time. I, I read philosophy. I went down that route for a while. I read, I read uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Sir Thomas, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said all ethics are absolute. He said, uh, he had a five-question test. And he said, if you, can, if you cannot answer yes to all five of these questions, what you are doing is unethical. That was his magic five answers. And for centuries in Europe, 
Everybody said, Tommy's got it. This is the right answer. Five questions, right or wrong, that's it. And they all applied Thomas Aquinas' test for ethics. The problem was, after a while, people realized, yeah, that probably was a little too strict. Then came along uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French philosopher, he said, you know what? Aquinas is wrong. All eth ethics are relative. It really depends upon where you were raised, how you were raised. Okay? In, some, if, in some countries, homosexuality is unethical. If, you know, others, it's perfectly accepted. Uh, you, you know, gay marriages. I mean, all, all of these things, it just depends. So in Amsterdam, you can do drugs. You can't do drugs here. Is one country ethical and one ethic, un unethical? So uh, Jean-Paul Sartre said, uh, said, it's all relative. It depends upon where you live, where you grow up. And everybody said, we like that. That's the answer. From now on, the world's answer is all ethics are relative. And then Sartre went one step too far, and he said, therefore, the Nuremberg trials are unethical because all those Nazis were doing were following orders. And everybody went, whoa, you've just gone a bridge too far. No way. We're not accepting that. And his whole theory collapsed with that. And if you want to know what the Nuremberg trials were, ask your waiter tonight. Okay. And uh, so then I went to Thomas Kant. Thomas Kant was a German philosopher who dedicated his entire life to finding what he called an ethical imperative or a moral imperative. He said, I am going to find a statement that answers all ethical conundrums for all time. And he did his entire life, and on his deathbed, he announced, I got nothing. Spent his entire life trying to figure this out, came up with nothing. So we think here in Whitewater, in a one-hour presentation, we're going to get the magic ethical answer. The best I can do is tell you to ask people, okay? But if you think you're going to get it, you're not. There's the golden rule, you know, uh, what would Jesus do? There's the religious answer, okay? Uh, I always remember somebody had a bumper sticker, what would Jesus drive? You know, and, and, and my reaction to that is, I'll tell you what Jesus would drive. Jesus would drive the biggest freaking SUV he could find for two reasons. One is the roads in Galilee sucked. And secondly, he went everywhere with his posse of 12 drinking buddies. They would not fit in the back of a Prius, okay? There's no way. So he'd drive a big SUV. Don't tell me he'd drive your little Prius You're going down the street with that. I hate that. I hate Prius drivers. Anyway, um, <laughs> no. That, so then the question was, well, maybe we can answer the question, what would Jesus do? All right, you know what? And this was my mother's answer. My mother, very Christian, she says, the Bible has all the answers. And I said, yeah, Mom, I was trying to figure out whether or not it was uh, ethical to reprice stock options. Do I look in Leviticus or Deuteronomy for that? I'm not sure. Because I can't find stock options anywhere in the Bible. So, so I went down that path, and I said, you know, the, the Bible is a wonderful book, but it doesn't answer all the questions. So really... It's a conundrum because mankind has been wrestling with this question for centuries. What is right and wrong? How do you define right and wrong at all times in all places? And in my opinion, it really comes down to your personal level of ethics and what you think is right and wrong and how you operate within that, within that, uh, that view. Although that bothers me a little bit too because there's the old question of do unto others as they would have them do unto you, which sounds really nice, but that also allows a, a masochist to be a sadist. Uh, there, was a guy, um, there was a guy who was involved in uh, G. Gordon Liddy. You ever hear the name G. Gordon Liddy? Again, ask a history major. G. Gordon Liddy was one of the Watergate conspirators during the Nixon years. And G. Gordon Liddy was a CIA black ops guy. And he, once, he said, when, when, when the whole Watergate thing unraveled, he called James Mitchell, who was kind of one of the heads of this, and he said, tell me what street corner to be on when and I will be there. And what he meant by that is, I failed, okay, this whole thing blew up, it, it went bad, I'll stand on a street corner and wait for the drive-by bullet to take me out. Now that was the kind of guy G. Gordon Liddy was, he just believed in that. Well, my fear is, if you say to him, the right answer for ethics is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, G. Gordon Liddy is more than willing to have somebody shoot him. So I don't particularly want him applying that philosophy and blowing away somebody else. So, I don't like the, the golden rule type answer. So we've struggled with this for years. But basically, I, I think some of the things I've talked about, asking, uh, uh, making sure that you understand that you get into these situations later and you can jump on them earlier, all of that can help you. I'd like to answer other questions. Somebody else have a question? I probably threw you off a little bit here. Sorry about that. Threw me off. Yeah. Put in the microphone, okay. <laughs> Do 
you know, as you're talking, you're an intelligent guy. I obviously I knew that, but the thing I want to know is, how do you make a strategic and ethical business decision that's not cookie cutter? You read like do this, do this, and this. Is it from experience? Is it from like what is it that helps you make that strategic? A good question. Decision? And 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 it is a lot of you know the the way. I make some of these decisions is based on a lot of experience. But let me give you an example of one ethical situation that I ran into um, at Badger Meter. Um, we found out that we had made and sold about a thousand oil meters that were geared in liters but labeled in, gal in quarts, okay? And if you remember your high school science, the difference between a liter and a quart is just a little bit, but it's off. And they said, here's the problem, Rich. If we recall this product line for this problem, um, it'll destroy the product line. Uh, nobody will buy these meters ever again, and about 200 employees will lose their jobs. The product line will be done, and we'll have to fire these 200 employees. So this one came to me, and I wrestled with it for a long time, uh, whether or not to do a product recall. And ultimately what I did was I went down to, I took my car down to a quick loop. Wasn't time for an oil change, but I wanted to have one done anyway. So I went to the quick lube, and I knew it was a quick lube that used our meters. And I said to the guy, listen, I want to watch him do this, if you don't mind. The guy said, fine, you can watch all you want. So I watched him, and he took our oil meter. You know these pistol grip things that dispense the oil that they use? It's like, like, you know, it's like a gas pump, but they use them in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the quick lube places. He took our meter, drained all the oil out of my car. He took our meter, and he put in, he set it for five quarts, and he put in the five quarts. All right? And when it was done, he clicked, and then he put the dipstick in, pulled it out, and went, oh, took the meter, shot a little more in, okay, and capped it on. And I said, do you charge by the quart? He goes, no, we charge one flat amount to fill your oil. We don't charge you for that little bit of extra. If your car takes five quarts of oil, we charge you for five quarts. We don't charge you for 5.2 because the meter said 5.2. And what I realized was the meter was being used as a rough guide so that he wouldn't overflow. It was not being used to bill for the oil. Therefore, the, that slight inaccuracy in the meter, that 3 or 4% inaccuracy, was not going to cause the customer to pay anymore because they don't charge for any more for the oil, and it wasn't going to cause the garage to lose any money, and it wasn't going to cause anybody to underfill the tank because they always dip, stick, and check. Therefore, that inaccuracy in the meter did not have an impact. I made the decision not to make that recall because I didn't want to lay off those employees. And, but that was a tough decision. I could have been criticized for that later. Had customers found out that those meters were inaccurate, I could have really taken a lot of heat for it. But I felt the chances of them ever finding out were minuscule. This was about 10 years ago. All those meters are out of the field. It doesn't matter now. But again, it was based on personal experience, and I, I did my homework. I went and investigated and found out exactly what the situation was. That's what you got to do. Um, and then the other thing, uh, one of my favorite stories you tell, I think it was Port Washington, but the, uh, the shoes one, if, if you can go off into that. I don't uh, remember a shoes one. The, uh, he got the key to the city. Oh, no, no, I, it, it, it was West Bend, Amity yeah. Leather. Yes. Um, I usually talk about this when I talk about, um, about why, why CEOs uh, fire American workers and send their jobs overseas. And frankly, let, let's talk about that, cause, and, and it will lead to this story. Um, I have, uh, when I started as CEO of Badger Meter 12 years ago, I had 350 shop floor workers in Milwaukee. I'm down to 120. By the end of this year, I should be down to 80, and my goal is by the end of 16 to have them all fired, okay, and have all of their jobs moved to Mexico, all right? Um, so I have been moving their jobs to Mexico, firing American workers, and giving their jobs to Mexicans. Um, I do this on a regular basis. It's kind of a plan. I'm, some of it's through attrition. Some of it is through firing. Uh, and so the question that I get very often is, or the question I ask is, from a business point of view, do you have a problem with that? Do you have a problem with American CEOs firing American workers and moving their jobs overseas? And you know why we're doing it? For the same reason we exist in business, to make more money for our shareholders. That's why we're doing it. Do you think that's an acceptable reason for doing it? Anybody want a piece of this before I go on? Anybody? It's warm in here. Maybe that's why 
I'm going to take my coat off. I don't know what anybody else is doing. Oh, I'm taking my coat off and I'm, okay. I will do it this way. Thank you. So anybody think about that? You're comfortable with that idea? The real question is, why are American CEOs doing this? Why are we firing American workers? And we, yeah, go ahead. Her, her point is, it's the idea of competitive advantage. If another country can do it at less cost, why not move it there? And you know, I, I do find this interesting because Americans, we tend to believe in two things. We tend to believe in free markets, and we tend to believe in human rights, all right? And free markets say, you should be able to shop anywhere you want. You should be able to buy from any place you want. And human rights say, all people have a right to have basic human rights. Whether they're Mexicans, Americans, Wisconsinites, Californians, we all have basic human rights. But then all of a sudden, when you raise this question, they go, no, no, don't give those jobs to those Mexicans. They should not have a right. Yeah, but the Mexicans outbid you for the job. The Mexicans agreed to do it cheaper than the Americans. They outbid in a free market. And since it's a free market, they should get it. Would you go to an auction and actually bid the higher price and have them say, I'm sorry, I, was gonna, I know you bid the higher price, but you're an American, we want to sell this to a Mexican. You'd be outraged. You bid the highest price. The Mexicans outbid the Americans for the jobs. They're willing to do it cheaper than my Milwaukee employees. So don't they have a right to have those jobs? They're humans too. They certainly have a right. And ultimately, who makes this decision? I don't make the decision. You guys made the decision. We asked you and you all agreed. We had a vote and you all voted. You all voted whether or not you want American CEOs to fire American workers and move their jobs overseas or to Mexico. And you all voted yes, you want it done. Now, do you remember the vote? You don't remember that vote, do you? You don't remember that referendum being on the ballot? Okay, why don't we do the vote right now? We'll just take the vote right now, it'll be very easy, and we'll find out how you feel about this. Um, if you want American CEOs to fire American workers and move their jobs to Mexico, you raise your hand. If you don't want American CEOs to fire American workers and move their jobs to Mexico, don't raise your hand. You ready? How many of you have ever bought anything at a Walmart? Please raise your hand. Look at that. You obviously want me to fire American workers and move their jobs to Mexico. The largest importer of Chinese goods and foreign goods is Walmart. And when you go to Walmart and you see two identical microwaves, one of them for $100 and one of them for $50, you know what you do? You buy the $50 microwave. You don't ever stop and say, well, wait a minute. If I buy this $50 microwave, are any Americans going to lose their jobs? You don't ask. And you don't care. You want the $50 microwave. And I've seen you guys. You drive down the street. Gasoline is on the right for $3.88 a gallon. Gasoline is on the left for $3.85 a gallon. And you know what you do? I've watched you. You turn left. You pull in and you buy the $3.85 gas. And you know what? At no time, you get out of your car to pump the gas. You don't even go inside and say to the owner of the gas station, before I buy your gas, could you tell me what the conditions were like on the drilling platform? Could you tell me whether the environment was negatively impacted with the procedures used on the drilling platform? Could you tell me if everybody got paid a minimum wage? Could you tell me if by buying this gas, I'm going to cause any Americans to lose their job? You don't ask any of those questions. You know why you don't ask those questions? Because you don't give You want $3.85 gas, don't you? That's what you want. And you know what else? You're standing in a damn sitco. You're buying gasoline from Hugo Chavez, who's been mass murdering people in Venezuela, and you don't care because you want $3.85 gas. That's what you want. So what do I do in response? I fire American workers, and I move their jobs to another country because you told me to do it. You made the decision. I had two water meters, one made in America, one made in Mexico. They were identical. One cost $40, the other one cost $35. I took them out to my customers. The customers said, I want the $35 water meter. I said, but it's not made in America. They said, I don't get it. I want the $35 water meter. If they're identical in quality, they're identical in performance, I want the $35 water meter. I don't care. And if you don't care, why am I supposed to care? Because basically, you're asking me to do your dirty laundry. I don't mind. It's my job. I'll do your dirty laundry. But then don't complain my hands stink because it's your stink on my hands. I'm handling your problems. I'm dealing with it. You just want the $3.85 gas. You just want the $50 microwave. You don't really care about the economic ramifications of it. And you know what? In a free market, in a global market, you shouldn't have to care. 
because it's a global market. And we all compete in the global market. And yes, it's unfortunate that Americans lose their jobs. It's terrible. But they need to retool and figure out how to compete because their, their skills are now outdated. They've been outbid on that work. They need to retool. And that's how we advance. Let's face it, there was a time in Wisconsin when they said, oh my God, you know what's happening? All the kids, they, 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 well first off, I hear people say, we can't lose these good paying factory jobs out of Wisconsin. We got these good, good paying factory jobs and we can't lose them. And I said, well that isn't the problem. The problem is that there was a time when 80% of the people in Wisconsin were employed on farms. And you know what happened? We had World War I. They went over, they saw Paris, they came back, and we said, how are we going to keep them down on the farm once they've seen gay Paris, when gay had a different meaning, okay? How are we going to keep them down on the farm? And we didn't. They all moved to the cities. And we said, oh my God, this is terrible. They're all leaving the farms. They're going to the cities to work in the factories. Maybe we should have a law that says they have to stay on the farms. And I said, well, that ain't the problem. The problem is there was a time when 80% of the people in Wisconsin were engaged in fur trapping. And then you know what they did? They came out of the forest and they went to the farms. Maybe we should have had a law saying they all have to stay fur trapping. Maybe you should all go back into the woods and be fur trappers. The world keeps changing. We keep reinventing ourselves. Madonna can do it. We can do it, okay? You just keep reinventing yourself. Do they even know who Madonna is anymore? Probably not. I don't know, okay? Um, I don't care. No, I, I, or who, who's the popular one? Lady Gagme. Lady Gagme reinvents herself or, or uh, Bouncy or whatever her name is. I don't know. All right. But they reinvent themselves, all right? We can do it too. That's the challenge. And the story of West Bend, the story of Amity Leather is one that I felt very personally because I knew the CEO up there and I knew the CFO. And the CEO up there, when, in the 1980s, when every leather company, Amity Leather was the largest employer in West Bend, it was a large leather company, and every leather company was moving to Taiwan, chasing cheap labor. And the CEO of Amity Leather got up and said, we are not moving one job to, to Taiwan. All of these good jobs are staying right here in West Bend. And for three years, the city praised him. He was the, he was the grand marshal of the parade. His face was on the front page of the newspaper. They said, this is the kind of CEO we need in America. The kind of CEO dedicated to American jobs. And for three years he basked in that glory, and then he retired. And two years later, Amity Leather filed bankruptcy and fired all 800 employees. Their building sits empty in the middle of West Bend like a post-apocalyptic wasteland now. That's what happened. And he knew it was going to happen. The son of a knew it was going to happen, but you know what? His attitude was, I'm three years from retirement, why should I take the heat? Let the next guy take the heat. He destroyed his company, cost 800 people their jobs because he wouldn't move 300 jobs to Taiwan and save 500. So you know what I do? I fire American workers and I move their jobs to Mexico. And by firing a few hundred American workers and moving their jobs to Mexico, I save the jobs of a thousand others. Because that's the job of a CEO. That's what I get paid to do. It's not pleasant, it's not pretty, but that's my job but I don't feel passionately about it. <laughs> Other questions I can answer? Anybody else have a question? You want to ask another question? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> they seem to let you be their spokesman. Someone's got to talk. Yeah, I agree. You're getting good exercise. Aren't I you? am, I am. Three years ago I had a stroke. They told me I'd never walk again. Can you imagine a low key guy like me having a stroke? It was just amazing. I couldn't, under, I couldn't understand it. When do you know, because you've been CEO for 12 years, yeah. when do you know that you, know, you, you, have a good, you have a nice job, it's stressful, when do you know, you know what, I've had enough, I, re I want to retire, oh. that's it? That's a really good question, okay? Um, I will be 60 in December. His question is, when do you know when it's time to hang it up? The average life of a CEO in public companies is seven years. After seven years, they either die, get fired, or retire. All right, so they don't last that long. Um, interestingly, in Milwaukee, we have in the last six months had a wave of CEOs hanging it up early. Fred Yonert, the CEO of Brady Corporation, 56 years old, announced his retirement last September. He's out. Uh, Bob Arsbecker, a very good friend of mine, CEO of Actuant Company, uh, salary of about a million and a half a year, okay? Uh, he's 54 years old. He just announced he's retiring. He's out. Jeff Joris, the CEO of Manpower Corporation, uh, 55 years old, has just announced he's retiring. 
And I asked, uh, I didn't get to see Yonert, but I asked Arsbecker and Joris, I said, why? Why are you hanging up? And they said, I can't take the, the pressure anymore. It's, it's a very high pressure job. It's a very stressful job. When I had my stroke, I said to my doctor, what did I do wrong? He said, uh, he said 55 years, 58 years of uh, cheeseburgers, martinis, and a high stress job. And I said, well, in fairness, I didn't start drinking nine martinis until I was nine, so that isn't quite right. But, um, but uh, it is a very high stress job, and it is a job that can send you to an early grave. Um, a, a woman once came up and she said, uh, I want to be a CEO. And I, she said, what kind of advice could you give me? And I said, well, you just need to do three things. I said, one, you have to not put your career on hold for five or six years while you start a family. And she said, I think I could do that. And I said, two, you got to be willing to travel a lot and work very long hours and miss your kids growing up. I did not go to the soccer games. I did not see my kids growing up. I was working very long hours. And she said, I think I could do that. And I said, three, you got to be willing to die 10 years younger. And she looked at me and I said, think about this one, okay? You really got to think about it. CEOs die about 10 years younger than the average man. And by the way, men die younger than women. We know that, right? And that's because women are smarter than us. Men are sprinters, women are cross-country runners. They've, they've figured out how to stay in it for the long term. Um, that's why the majority of the wealth in America is controlled by women. As much as women like to say that, they, that, they're, that they're treated poorly in the workforce and everything else, okay, first off, they're in the majority. Men are a minority in this country. Women are majority. There's 51% women, 49% men. So women are in the majority. And the reason there's 51% women and 49% men is because the men die earlier and the women are still alive and they live longer. And the reason why 70% of the wealth in America is controlled by women, it's because when the men die, who gets all the wealth? The women. There are a lot of very wealthy women in this country. So, so I mean, it, it is a highly stressful job. So the question is, when am I going to hang it up? Three years ago, I had a stroke. They told me I wouldn't walk again. They were wrong. Um, I, I bounced back from it. I was fortunate. I think if my health holds up, I'd like to do this five more years. I'd like to go to 65. Um, you know, I, I, I function pretty well in this world. Um, so I think I can manage it. Also, it depends on what happens with my company. You never know. Company could get sold, company could get bought, whatever. All of those things could happen too. And finally, there are a few things I want to finish. I've got some tasks that I've been working on. Uh, the, the, the Water Council is a huge project of mine that, that, that's gone very well. We opened the Global Water Center. I'm excited about that. But there are some more things I'd like to do. I am mentoring people within Badger Meter to be my possible replacement. I don't think they're going to be ready for about another three years. So, uh, so if I were to hang it up right now, the board would go outside. They would hire an outsider. I would rather see one of the people under me, one of my vice presidents, have the shot at it. So I would rather get them to a position where the board would seriously consider them. So all of those factors come into play. And that and the fact that my wife told me she married me for, for dinner and not lunch. Um, so she doesn't want me around during the day is the point there. Um, and, uh, so, and, I, I, and I love my wife dearly. She's broken right now. Um, she, she had foot surgery, so she's five weeks into a nine-week recovery. I'm basically her helper monkey. Um, I've, I've, I've learned how to do things around the house that in 35 years I haven't done. Do you know there's something called a lint trap on a dryer and it has to be cleaned out? <laughs> this is, I'm convinced there are, this proves there are not enough female mechanical engineers in the world. Because if there were more female mechanical engineers, that lint trap would be self-cleaning, okay? <laughs> because, you know, years ago men drove most of the cars. I don't roll down my window and reach out to wipe off the rain, okay? Some male engineer figured that one out, okay? If there were more female engineers, we would have self-cleaning lint traps, all right? But no, I'm standing there cleaning the out of the lint trap. I didn't know about it. Apparently it builds up in there. It gets really big and bad. But, so, anyway. Yeah, so she's, she had foot surgery, and I considered getting a new wife, but apparently it would cost me half of everything I got, so I'll keep my broken one. It's, gonna, it's cheaper in the long run, so... People ask me how she hurt her foot, and I said, uh, well, I said it was uh, 20 years of pole dancing on stiletto heels. You know, it's tough on the ankles. It really is. And she didn't start till she was 40, and it's really a younger girl's game, you know. But, but we needed the money, so it was, it, was, it was good that she did that. Um, but it gets to you after a while. It's just tough on the ankles. It really is. So, no, she, she had a, a bad ankle problem and got ankle surgery. So I got a few more weeks of this, and then I can... Uh, I, I, had to, I had to plan all my travels. I got all my travels done before the surgery, and I'm not leaving again until the end of May when I go to, uh, to Europe for two weeks. 
Um, so I, I, I'm trying to wedge this in for her full recovery. So I'm trying to be a supportive husband. I've had to up my game and she's had to lower her expectations. We're pretty close, but not quite there. I keep explaining to her, honey, I am operating at the top of my game. Okay, this is it. I, I cannot do any more. This is as, as high as I get. Uh, on, on Saturday, I had the grocery list. I said, I'm going to go to the, to the Piggly Wiggly and I'm going to buy all the stuff on the grocery list. She goes, well, no, the cat food we buy at Target and the, the Kleenexes we buy at Walmart. Because I said, honey, I'm going to one place and buying all Okay, one place. She said, well, the cats don't like the salmon. They don't like, they'll, buy, they'll eat whatever I buy them, okay? This is it. She's got to understand, I'm at the top of my game. I'm at the breaking point here, people. Okay, I got nothing left. Jesus. So, yes. Do we have policies on whistleblowing in our companies? All public companies have to have policies on whistleblowing, uh, including an ethics hotline that actually comes into my office. We have had an ethics hotline in our company for 40 years. So we, we put one in long before it was ever required. And in fact, we go a step further because when you call our ethics hotline, it says this is the ethics hotline. Please leave a message. If you want to be a uh, response, leave your name. If you don't leave your name, we can't give you a personal response. Um, and they said, by the way, if this is, if you don't want to leave this with Mr. Mewson, here is the phone number and email address of the head of the audit committee on the board. So if somebody wants to blow the whistle on me, they have a way. That's the flaw of ethics hotlines in most companies. You want to blow the whistle on the CEO, it's the CEO who gets the call. So it, it actually goes there. Almost every call is, my boss told me to get to work and didn't tell somebody else to get to work when I was reading the newspaper, and that's unethical. I mean, it's a lot of HR issues where people just, you know, they, they don't understand the difference between an ethics issue and an HR issue. I don't like my boss. He yells at me. You know, it's that kind of stuff. We investigate every call. We investigate every one of them. Other questions I can answer? It's 424. I'm going to thank you all for your attention, and uh, I appreciate uh, listening to me. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Rich. Always very entertaining, sometimes offensive, but always educational, right? So, no, I'm just kidding. But, but, you know, and, and before you leave, so tomorrow we have a session uh, in Highland. Let's see. 2102, I believe. So uh, 2101, Michelle Thoren from Sintas will be here. So make sure to come if you have the chance. And also, I know some of you are here for credit, so do sign up. I did pass around like a sign-up sheet and make sure to sign your name. And finally, we have some treats outside. I believe there are some cookies and so on and coffee and so on. We can't have them in the room here, so help yourself on the way out. Otherwise, we have to throw that away. So again, please join me to thank Rich for an amazing talk as always. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much.